Hi. The Dodgers have improved their winning streak to seven games. L.A. Plaschke of the L.A. Times doubles down on stupid regarding the Lakers coaching search. And the Rams. You know, they're not only effective in late rounds of the NFL draft. They actually do a tremendous job finding players who contributed in undrafted free agents. So we're going to take a quick look at some who might actually contribute for the defending Super Bowl champs. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is Faithful Angelinos. I'm in a tremendous mood. It's uh, May 22nd, 2022. And yes, of course, feel free to say hi to Cock Blocker the Cat making her daily appearance when I'm at the home studio. We added new subscribers yesterday. Thanks for getting in on the ground floor. If you like the content we've been putting out, clickety-clack the like button, clickety-clack the subscribe button. There's a notifications bell. Hit that. We put out new videos between 9 and 10 a.m. every day to let you know it's there. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And yes, comment. I created this channel because I get bored. I like talking sports. So before we get to the main topic of Rams football, let's go to the news and the notes. Yesterday, the Dodgers, Mookie Betts, goes three for four, scores a run, drives in three more. The Dodgers defeated the Phillies 7-4. They have a one-and-a-half game lead in the NL West and that seven-game winning streak. They could sweep the Phillies this morning. At 10.30, Tony Gonsolin takes the mound. He's 4-0, and Zach Elfin is 1-3, and three, or 1-3 and three for Philly. Meanwhile, yesterday out in Columbus, Ohio, LAFC, they outlasted four hours worth of weather delays. Carlos Vela scores, and they, uh, LAFC, they take over first place in the Western Conference standings for MLS with that 2 nothing victory over Columbus. Now, they might not have it after tonight all, all their own. Austin is going to play later tonight. They might, uh, if Austin wins, it's a tie. Meanwhile, it is Galaxy Game Day. They will be taking on Houston Dynamo at 5 o'clock over at Dignity Health Sports Park. And yes, we have an updated Kevin Cabral Watch 2022. Please admire the amount of money I paid for this graphic. Because it is almost as impressive as Kevin Cabral playing 690 minutes, getting paid $1.6 million dollars. For zero goals and zero assists. Well done. Well done. I know that Galaxy fans like me have a love-hate relationship with the front office. This, this makes Giovanni Dos Santos look like Mohamed Salah. Let's be real. This is absolute stellar use of resources. Good job, whoever decided to sign this guy. Let's get to the notes before we go with the Rams. I want to start off by talking about the Dodgers. See, one of my purposes, I think, with this channel, as a former uh, sports writer for a daily newspaper, is to let you know when sports writers are complete idiots. And we've run across two good examples in the last couple of, uh, last couple of days. MajorLeagueBaseball.com columnist John Heyman believes the Dodgers will cut Trevor Bauer if he wins his appeal. Now, we've gone through the whole Trevor Bauer case over and over. I don't, I, I hate breaking it down. None of us were there. Blah, 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 blah. Right? But here's my problem with the idea of these sports writers who are really crusading for the Dodgers to cut Trevor Bauer. If you cut Trevor Bauer, you get nothing for Trevor Bauer. Matter of fact, you might be on the hook to continue paying Trevor Bauer. On the other hand, if you keep Trevor Bauer, maybe have him pitch in the minors, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all predicated on Bauer winning the appeal. But you have him pitch in the minors, maybe you get something back in trade. It's not a done deal that they cut Trevor Bauer. Stop, stop drinking the hopium. Meanwhile, also with the Dodgers, left-handed starting pitcher Andrew Heaney, he hasn't pitched for the Dodgers in a month. He's had uh, shoulder inflammation, I believe. He tossed 30 pitches off of a mound on Friday. Uh, Dave Roberts said Heaney is actually close to returning to in-season form, maybe a couple of weeks away. We'll figure it out. 
Clayton Kershaw and Tommy Connolly, who all are also pitchers, we all already know about Kershaw, they've been out for a couple of weeks. They're going to be out for a couple of more weeks. Matter of fact, they're not even with the team. Both of them went home. Now, Conley's in, uh, case is kind of interesting. He has a bone bruise in his pitching elbow because they were worried about uh, forearm inflammation. He was getting an MRI. Now, I do MRIs now, you know, since the news industry just basically imploded. I needed a job, so I went into healthcare. When somebody tells me they have forearm pain, I didn't want to say this because I'm not a doctor, but when somebody tells me they have forearm pain, I'm thinking about the elbow because you have tendons and joint, you know, you have tendons that attach your muscles to it. So yeah, it's apparently it's in the elbow. Uh, they think it's due to Tommy John surgery that the guy had a couple of years ago. And as for Kershaw, the uh, SI joint, it's hip adjacent. He's basically kicking it in Texas now. Bill Plaschke of the LA Times is still touting Doc Rivers to be the head coach of the Lakers. Doc Rivers, who already has a job coaching in Philly, who used to coach the Celtics, the hated Celtics, and oh, by the way, the Lakers have already settled on two or three finalists. I thought I was too stubborn to admit when I was wrong. Bill, drop it. He's not going to be the Lakers coach. Is every sports writer, I already used the pun, is every sports writer drinking that much hopium in this, this desperate attempt to be right? Doc Rivers is not happening. Put down the boom box underneath his window. It's not happening. By the way, we were talking yesterday about the Lakers coaching search and I neglected to add uh, what I see as a salient point. And if I'm right, it underscores the problem of what we were talking about yesterday with too many cooks in the broth up at the Lakers hierarchy. See, back in the day when the Lakers were good, it was basically Dr. Buss uh, telling Jerry West to make all the decisions. And now, if you're going to be the Lakers coach, you have to have multiple interviews with as many as six, seven, eight different people. So here's where I'm coming from. One source yet, yet a couple of days ago tells The Athletic that there were three finalists to be the coach. Another told ESPN that there were two. What could that mean? Does it mean that this inside cabal, this Game of Thrones crap between six to eight people inside the Lakers organization are trying to stab each other in the back and try to keep Kenny Atkinson? Uh, either and trying to like blackball Kenny Atkinson from getting the head coach, or they're trying to keep Kenny Atkinson in the fold to try to argue that he should be the coach. Does that make sense? In other words, I'm saying one person in the Lakers inner sanctum is leaking information to the athletic and another person in the inner sanctum with his own agenda is leaking to ESPN instead of having one person make the decision. That's a big problem. That is a big problem. And how does that relate to Russell Westbrook? We're hearing one of the people in the inner sanctum, Phil Jackson, loves Russell Westbrook and others don't. So what I'm telling you is that there's so many people in there with so many different agendas that they keep screwing over what the Lakers should eventually try to accomplish. The Lakers absolutely have to simplify who makes decisions in that place. But let's talk about happier teams. Let's talk about teams with more success recently. Now the Rams, they sign as many as 17 undrafted free agents. Now most teams, when it comes to undrafted free agents, you're just shooting it up. You're just taking the flyer, seeing what's, throws it against the wall, see what sticks, you know, because you already have high draft picks to replenish your roster. The Rams don't have high draft picks. They trade them away to bring in established stars. So they need all the help they can get in the back end of the draft. And they also need to have some of these undrafted free agents hit, not just to be guys who are just randomly showing up on special teams to get their heads kicked in. And the Rams have had success at it. For example, last year, you might remember that both left tackles, Andrew Whit Whitworth and Joe Noteboom were injured at the same time. So who was gonna play left tackle? It turned out to be an undrafted free agent rookie Alaric Jackson, who used to play for the University of Iowa, started at left tackle for a team that wound up winning the Super Bowl. 
So let's take a look and see what we got this year because the Rams do have, still have holes and hopefully some of these guys can fill in. Now, what do we know that the Rams have in terms of needs? They probably could use a little bit of depth at tight end. Uh, they could use another defensive lineman or two, a linebacker and cornerbacks. I think the person who has the best shot at not only making the team, but making an impact, will probably wind up being Roger Carter, a tight end out of Georgia State. Now, how do I believe, why do I believe this? I've gone through about four or five different sources. I've read about a bunch of article, articles. There's a lot of Rams blogs out there. The thing with Roger Carter, four year starter for Georgia State, yes, it's a small school, but he has lower pow uh, body power, which means he is able to block for the run. So that makes him valuable because when the Rams run, as we, as we know, they bring in the wide receivers tight in their formation. Everybody helps out on the offensive line to make sure that there's gonna be holes for Cam Akers to hit. But he's not just a, uh, a blocking tight end. He caught so many passes for Georgia State and he made such an impression on Georgia State that the school actually promoted their tight ends coach to offensive coordinator. They thought this guy coached up Carter so well that they basically said, screw it, you're in charge of the whole offense now. Now, I'm not going to sit there and claim that this guy is going to be uh, ousting Tyler Higby from the starting lineup, but Tyler Higby did get hurt last year. Even during the playoffs, he didn't play in the Super Bowl. Roger Carter can make an impact. And if he doesn't, they sign another guy, Jamal Pettigrew from McNeese State. Now he's more of a blocking tight end. Possibly uh, possibly a little better maybe in the passing game than Carter. Um, it could be that the Rams take one or both of these guys and put them on the roster. Recall, last year, the Rams, when Higby went down, there was a guy named Kendall Blanton. Blanton, who made a bunch of receptions for the Rams, also an undrafted free agent. Are you seeing how the Rams operate here when I describe this for you? You don't hear about undrafted free agents making big splashes for a lot of other teams. I think another guy who has a pretty good shot is Jake Hummel, a weak side linebacker out of Iowa State. See, the Rams are traditionally good at finding linebackers who produce late. Not game changers in linebacker, but people who produce. Do you remember Corey Littleton? undrafted free agent. Troy Reeder, who I believe left the team and went to the Chargers over the offseason. Both of them undrafted free agents who wound up starting for the Rams. Hull's strength is that he reads plays and he gets to the point of attack very quickly. And because of that, he can be a three down player for the Rams. Another reason he can be the three down player for the Rams, Iowa State plays a 3-3-5 alignment. And if you think the way the Rams normally go, you'd call it a 3-4, but they pull a linebacker out a lot because they want to have a fifth quarterback in there. In other words, 3-3-5, which is exactly in Jay Hummel's wheelhouse. Could he be that similar for what the Rams try to accomplish on D? Other guys I like include Jake Snyder, a guard out of San Jose State. Uh, he could wind up being a depth piece. And again, like we mentioned earlier, Allery Jackson played for the Rams. Could be a sleeper pick. Uh, the Rams also like cornerbacks late in the draft. Uh, Duran Love out of Liberty might wind up making the team for one reason and one reason only. He ran a 4.3940. That has a return guy written all over it, and Tutu Atwell did not impress last year. If not, TJ Carter out of uh, TCU could play. Possibly. Possibly. Why? Well, there's two reasons. He played both cornerback and safety, and seven interceptions in college. So he knows how to make plays. Now, again, I'm not saying all these guys will make impact, but if you were sitting there watching the Super Bowl last year, thinking to yourself, who the hell is Kendall Blanton? If you were watching late in the regular season last year, wondering who the hell is Alaric ja Jackson, now you know where they came from. So if you liked today's episode of Faithful Angelinos, thank you very much. Like and subscribe to the channel. We are trying to build something here, talking about LA sports. I'm James. Thanks for watching. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corta El Queso production. Have a great day.